Barbara and I were in Paris, sitting across the table from one another at this little creperie on Boulevard Saint-Jacques. We just had a charming day and a wonderful meal. The weather was perfect and we were on our own with all of Paris around us. That was when the question struck me, what do you do with your knife and fork after the meal? I've long been interested in table etiquette. If we were in the US, generally, when you finish a meal, you just leave the fork on a 45 degree angle. You probably haven't touched the knife. It's still sitting where it was when you arrived at the table. And at any rate, at a US restaurant, the server is probably going to ask you if you're finished before touching the plate. But in France, things are different. It's more formal. And servers don't generally speak unless they're spoken to. Now in the Royal Navy, the steward would do nothing with a plate until the diner had placed his knife and fork parallel to one another on the plate at six o'clock, pointing to 12 o'clock. But what about in a little creperie on Boulevard Saint-Jacques, having just had a charming day and a wonderful meal, the weather being perfect and being on our own with all of Paris around us, what do you do with your knife and fork then? That's a little tedious, isn't it? To talk about a knife and fork in slightly different dining environments, what do you do with two pretty elementary utensils? If your brother trespasses against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. That one instruction from the Bible passage that we're reading for the gospel this morning, that is much more simple than any table manners and frighteningly more complicated. Learning to live with people demands much, much more of us than living with objects. Do you want to know more? Well, what do you say? Let's walk through these doors and let's worship God. Blessed good morning to you one and all and welcome to Drexel Hill United Methodist Church this 14th Sunday after Pentecost. Welcome to worship. Let's begin now our worship by joining together in our call to worship included in your bulletin. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. The hour is coming, and now is, when true worshippers will worship God in spirit and in truth. For such worshippers, God seeks. Enter God's gates with thanksgiving, God's courts with praise. Give thanks to the Lord. Bless God's name. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. When I feel afraid, think I've lost my way. As long as you are near, please be with me to the end. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. 
Let us continue with our worship now by joining together in our collect for the morning. Let us pray. O oh God, you bear your people ever on your heart and mind. Watch over us in your protecting love that, strengthened by your grace and led by your spirit, we may not miss your way for us, but enter into your glory, made ready for all in Christ our Lord. Amen. As we move now to our service of confession, I say to you, we know ourselves to be a broken people, separated from ourselves, others, and the Lord of life. Let us then confess our brokenness together. All merciful, tender God, you have given birth to our world, conceiving and bearing all that lives and breathes. We come to you as your daughters and sons, aware of our aggression and anger, our drive to dominate and manipulate others. We ask you to forgive us, and by the gentle touch of your Spirit, help us to find a renewed sense of compassion, that we may truly live as your people in service to all. Amen. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us receive our pardon in one voice, saying, Thanks be to God. And now, dear sisters and brothers, the peace of Christ be with you, and also with you. Let us join now together in praying the prayer our Lord taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And do not forget all his benefits. He forgives all your iniquities. He delivers your life from the pit. He crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. He satisfies you with good as long as you live, so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. The Lord works vindication and justice for, for all who are oppressed. He makes known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and generous, low to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always accuse, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. If another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you 
are alone. If the member listens to you, you have gained that one. But if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If the member refuses to listen to you then, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. It's Labor Day weekend, and I pray tomorrow you all have a blessed Labor Day and rest. Rest from your labors. What better way to celebrate? Everyone will remember something about being taught table manners. But what else do we learn about? What else are we taught how to behave? Were you ever taught how to deal with conflict? Now, there's a leap in scope. I mean, table manners are mighty refined and defined, specific in duration and location. Table manners are meant for the table during meal times. But conflict? The uses of learning about conflict are broad ranging. They go all over the place and all over time. Some ways of responding to conflict are guaranteed to keep conflict going. There are those who love conflict and always search for ways to be well wounded and offended and outraged. There are even those who just love conflict in and of itself. Have you ever seen the Three Stooges, Curly, Larry, and Moe? They do it for laughs. What do other people do it for? What do you use conflict for? And why do you choose to avoid conflict? Conflict is simply inevitable in human relations. It, it means that there are more than two minds involved in any given circumstance. There are all sorts of ways of handling conflict. And Jesus here in Matthew is describing the way of dealing with conflict if one of your own sins against you, go and share that fact with that person and sort it out among yourselves. Wow! Now that is crystal clear, plain, and simple. Why is it so difficult? It seems a mite confrontational for those who like to avoid conflict, but but maybe there's a, another scripture in here. Maybe we can find one that says to avoid conflict. No. The scripture we manage to remember might say more about us than it does about God. Here we go. Why perceivest thou the mote in thine brother's eye, when all the while perceiveth thou not the log which is in thine own eye?
Have you ever imagined? Have you ever heard? Have you ever thought about, oh, I won't confront her with that. I, I probably did something wrong too. I'm just as much to blame. Let's let sleeping dogs lie. It's funny how so many of us at many times prefer not to face conflict. But conflict, especially early, can be an indication that something's wrong that needs to be righted. And it can be handled with charity and with grace and also an opportunity before things get too heavy for the other person to respond in kind with charity and grace. Funny how so many of us, many times, prefer not to address conflict. And yet, the opportunity that conflict offers to come to a clearer understanding with our sisters and brothers is invaluable. Conflict may be uncomfortable, but there are beautiful possibilities by going through the reality of conflict. There are ways of dealing with conflict that are perfectly acceptable in our society. There is no legal penalty. There is no social embarrassment attached to conducting oneself in certain fashions that also happen not to be Christian. And so there's still work to do. We're not going to ram Christianity down anybody's throats. But we do have a way of being to offer to the world, a way of being where conflict is addressed early and addressed first with the persons involved and gradually has a way of resolution. It's a beautiful way, indeed, we believe it is the way, the truth, and the life. God bless you this Labor Day weekend and bless you in your lives dealing with conflict according to the love of God and offering this way, this truth, this life to the world in humility and love. Amen. As we move now to our sending forth, I say to you, to live is to risk and to care. We are ready to live for all humankind. Life is mission. We choose to be sent. And now as you have been gathered in from the world to hear the gospel proclaimed, I send you back now into that same world to tell of God's love in Jesus Christ. Take this benediction with you. God the Creator, God the Redeemer, God the Sustainer be with you now and remain with you evermore. Amen. <laughs>